Good evening, and welcome to the Christian Truckers Network. This is a ministry that welcomes guest speakers to share their testimonies as well as the Word of God as the Holy Spirit leads. If you would like to be a participant, you can call in at 641-715-0689. Then they'll ask for an access code, and that is 863-397, and then the pound sign. Again, that number is 641-715-0689. The access code is 863-397, and then the pound sign. Well, I am very happy to have our guest speaker here with us tonight. A little bit different than what we normally are accustomed to. Um, You know, with different uh, preachers coming and sharing the word, and others coming and sharing testimonies. Tonight is uh, our brother, Bo. Uh, He's with Vigilante Truth. Uh, He owns uh, Vigilante Trucking down in uh, North Carolina. His ministry is dealing with human trafficking. And we all know or heard about it, but have we really thought about it? Have we really looked into it as, uh, you know, I know myself, you know, I have uh, daughters. Uh, I have a couple granddaughters that are coming up. They're a little bit young right now to be out of uh, range of their parents or whatever. But, you know, we need to be very concerned about this. This is a personal, uh, bringing it personally to us because this is happening right there in each and every one of your neighborhoods. So with that being said, um, I would like that you would all just pay real close attention to what is being spoken here tonight, and uh, I want you to really meditate on this. So, Brother Bo, um, enlighten us to what's going on around us. Well, thank you, for first and foremost, for allowing me the uh, opportunity to share God's heart for uh, ending trafficking in the United States, and it's just truly an honor to be able to, to, to speak with you tonight and uh and get this message out. I guess uh, from your introduction, I, I, I'm going to, since I have a little bit of time, maybe uh, give a testimonial and then do a little preaching. And, uh, and in the meantime, uh, throughout that, uh, educate everybody listening as to the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world, as well as the fastest growing enterprise in our country, our states, and our cities. Um, that would be faster growing than drugs and guns and Internet fraud. I mean, truly the fastest growing criminal enterprise right now is human trafficking. So um, it's, I'll, I'll, it's a dark subject. I try to keep it as light as possible. Uh, if I ruin someone's dinner hour tonight, I apologize in advance. And if I ruin your breakfast appetite tomorrow morning, I also apologize in advance. Uh, it's a very serious issue, uh, but at the same time, uh, you can find joy in anything, and, and the joy I find is in the restoration of both the victims uh, and the men uh, that, that are consumers of those victims. So that's where we'll start with it. Uh, for me, I think I was like 99.9% of the people who will listen to this message. Uh, six, seven years ago, I knew nothing about trafficking, um, had heard the term, uh, but when I would hear the term human trafficking, I would automatically relate it. Uh, to to drug trafficking, um, you know, a smuggling of something across the border, and, and really, the the term human trafficking is a term that I don't even like to use. I think it misleads the general public into what's really going on, uh, on in the United States and and, and across the world. Um, I like to use the term human slavery. Um, it's not about, and this will probably be the biggest surprise, it's not about smuggling girls, especially when you're talking the trucking transportation industries. This is not we're loading up a, a truckload of, of Mexican females and, and bringing them across the border into California and then spreading them out through the country. And so as a, a trucking company owner, I'm involved in this to quit the smuggling of females across the border. It's not that at all. Um, what it actually is is human slavery here in the United States, and 80% of the victims being trafficked right now in our country are born in our country. So that's the reason I don't like to, to introduce that trafficking word. It, it, it's not across the border. It's already here. And of course, you have the other 20% are people being brought in from other countries uh, to meet the demand of, for services here in our country. But the focus really needs to be on your local uh, your local Girl Scout, you know, your, your local PTA mom. Um, it's it's a, it's an all-age kind of problem. Your sisters, your daughters, your mothers. Um, 
and we'll go into why that that's true and why we need to be aware of it. Um, but again, going back six, seven years ago, I didn't know anything about it. I uh, offered to meet with a wonderful couple, um, the the wife, and they were in their early 30s. In, excuse me, early 30s, but the wife was a medical doctor, and she had walked away from her career, and the husband was a veterinarian. Uh, he had walked away from his career. And those two individuals, and I've not met any individuals like them since, had gone into the streets of Nicaragua and lived in the streets as homeless people along with the girls that were being trafficked in order to become entrusted by them and were able to actually rescue three girls out and, and uh, buy a cinder block house with a tin roof and taught them to make jewelry and as, as a living. And, and it's a beautiful story. Um, they had returned back to the United States to raise some money so that they could go back to Nicaragua. Both of, uh, well, the husband was an American and the wife was a Honduran-born national. Um,
Welcome. This service is provided by freeconferencecall.com. Please enter job cost code followed by the pound or hash sign. There are four participants in the conference. The recording has a money for transaction. So muted. The uh, the truck drivers are, are willing to be the consumer demand. And, and so I ended up with a trucking company so that I could be an authentic trucking company owner and speak into the lives of truck drivers so that I could effectually do my best to end 50% of human trafficking. So that's the long and short of how I found out about trafficking, how I got into trucking, and, and that was a little over six years ago. And we've just been walking out God's plan for this ever since. Uh, as far as, as giving and understanding, just a, a general awareness of what's going on in the United States, it is the fastest growing criminal enterprise, but what does that really mean? Uh, what it really means is there's $9.8 billion spent every single year to have sex with these victims, with these slaves. Now, I don't know if you've ever had $9.8 billion before, but that would be more money than all professional sports combined is spent on games and ticket sales. and All of that doesn't even add up to $9.8 billion. So that will give you the size in the United States of America of the money and the market place that uh, that this is this is going on um, I like to, to use an example while I'm talking about sports uh, I'm a Charlotte North Carolina resident and in Charlotte we have the Carolina Panthers and whether you like them or not on any given Sunday at 1 p.m. there will be 74 thousand employees so call it 80,000 and somebody will were to do something terrible, drop a bomb at 2 p.m. in that stadium, and all 80,000 of those people lost their lives, not only would Charlotte hear about it, not only would the state of North Carolina hear about it, not only would the USA hear about it, but really worldwide would hear about it, and, and it would be talked about for years to come. And yet we have 500,000 young ladies, average age of 13, in our country that are going to be sexually assaulted, raped, have to perform a sexual act 10 to 15 times a day. 10 to 15 times a day, 365 days a year. And yet we don't hear about it. It's not on the news. Nobody likes to talk about it. Um, that's the kind of thing that still gets me passionate, gets me angry, uh, gets me frustrated. But that's the reality of, of where our country's at today, and that's, that's the reality and the reason for me, me to be here uh, talking to you guys tonight. Um, so that's the USA, and, and for me, I've always, on, on, on a preaching side and a sales side, I've always said you don't go across town to try to sell your product or, or spread your message if you haven't already talked to your neighbors. So my heart with God's always been America's a pretty big mission field if you look close, and so... God literally put me in a mission field to, to in trafficking right here in North Carolina because North Carolina is the 10th highest state in ranking for sex trafficking in the country. And then Charlotte uh, here in North Carolina is the eighth worst city for trafficking in the country. So it really gives me a nice devil's playground to go play in uh, bring some light into the darkness. But, so that's, that's where, where I've been the last six years. That's uh, the battle that I fight. I do travel around the country when invited. Um, I like to work with different law enforcement agencies when invited. Um, as an example of that, I was in Houston last year before the Super Bowl for a week working with Houston Vice, and gosh, they picked up over 400 guys leading into the Super Bowl. Uh, they were doing John Stings. Um, so that's a, a, exceptional. But um, I, I, a lot of my what I'll call revelation learning has come in and around North Carolina and the Charlotte area. Um, and, and I'll bring that back up as we're talking about supply and demand curves later on. But just remember that Charlotte's the eighth worst city in the country for sex trafficking. Um, 
that would bring me to a coin that I keep in my pocket. Maybe you guys have some of these as well. A man gave it to me, and uh, it's, it's the armor of God. And so it's, it's always a reminder to put the armor on every day. And I like to keep this coin in my pocket. And any time that I'm speaking on trafficking, I like to pull that coin out, and I just rub on it a little bit, and it reminds me of, of really what we're dealing with. And as I use this coin as an analogy, on one side of it is supply. And for me, as a businessman, Everything becomes a product, and so in my mind, sex trafficking is a product, and that product is $9.4 billion, excuse me, $9.8 billion a year, and, and so it's a great product. Everybody's enjoying it, and how is it then that uh, most people are trying to affect supply, get it on the shelves, and so I'm just re-engineering my mental uh, you know, skill set to get the product off the shelves. So, but the supply is is the girls, and the manufacturer is God, and the salespeople, the distributors, would be your traffickers, to, to keep the analogy going there. And then the thin edge of this coin, and it's about the size of a half dollar, but the thin edge of this coin is what I call rescue, because we all want to hear about this, and then we want to get mad, and then we want to go kick down some doors and shoot some traffickers, and I understand that. It makes a whole lot of sense to me. But the reality of what's going on in our country is this little bitty thin edge is the amount of young ladies who are actually being pulled out, less than 1%, less than half of 1%. In fact, in the United States of America last year, where 500,000 girls uh, are being trafficked in our country, there was less than a couple of hundred that were rescued. Another thing to make you passionate and frustrate you a little bit about this issue. Then on the other side of this coin is the demand, and that makes up all the men, uh, not the traffickers and not the pimps, not the handlers. Those three words are all synonymous. Um, so not the people that, that are distributing and bringing these girls to the marketplace, but the men who are actually paying. So for every one girl who's being trafficked today, there's going to be 10 or 15 men who are her customers that are going to pay her anywhere from $20 for some kind of sex act to... Uh,
Welcome. This service is provided by freeconferencecall.com. Please enter job cost code followed by the pound or hash sign. There are five participants in the conference. The recording has started. Well, now you're down to 50,000 females right, that are needed. And, and not that number is certainly too many. Muted. But at the same time, um, that number is less than 500,000. And so we're, we're working our way to ending it. And so at Vigilante Truth, the trucking part, you know, I talked about that earlier, and I'll bring some of these points back around. If we have 50,000 customers, or I'm sorry, 50% of the customers, affect the demand there. You know, what, what, what can we do? So I have uh, put big, huge billboards on my tractors and my trailers and uh, blatantly says right across the top of the tractor, stop the selling of rape. So let's look at that statement uh, because I use the word rape and I talk about the selling of rape and I haven't used that word yet tonight, not in this first 30 minutes, but from here on out, you're going to understand this one point and it's going to be very... Uh, very productive in, in countering demand. When a, a truck driver, um, we've, we've done stakeouts in, in truck stops, and, and um, so I understand how this works. A truck driver pulls in, he parks, and a young lady will come up and knock on the door and ask if he wants any company, and, and if he says yes, she'll get in the truck with him. Um, they'll have a sexual act and, and a transfer of money, and she'll hop out the passenger door and go knock on the next driver's door at the truck next to him. That driver, that man, that human man, he has put a value on that young lady of whatever that dollar bill was for for her services. So if it's $20 or $100, that's what he's valued that young lady at. And I'm going to come back to value of females later. But what he thinks has happened is a consensual sexual business deal. Uh, she was smiling. He didn't hit her. Uh, she wasn't bleeding. She wasn't crying. And when it was over, she, you know, took the money. She might not have looked back. She might have thrown him a middle finger. Who knows at that point? But the reality is he never had to hurt her in his mind. And she was doing the offering. She's the one that knocked on the door. She's the one that, that, that started the whole encounter. So how could he be guilty of anything um, you know, even, even if he's just a single man with no kids, never been married, right? So what he doesn't understand is outside of that, and it, it reminds me of a 74-year-old trucker I was talking to, and he said, Bo, you're right. I remember this girl coming down. She was working truck to truck to truck. She had a big smile on her face, cute as a button. I don't know. She said she was 18, but she probably was only 16. But the point was I've just never seen a salesperson works so hard as that girl did. And I said to him, well, here's, here's what you don't know. You saw that. I said, but what you don't know is, is she has been threatened with her life, blackmailed with the life of her friends and her family and perhaps her own children. She's been beaten. She's seen other girls killed. So she understands it's a life or death thing. And so she's selling for all she's worth because... The reality is, if she doesn't make $1,000 that day, and that's the, the average quota for a sex trafficked female in, this, in the country, the United States of America, is $1,000 a day she has to make. And it doesn't matter whether it's a $20 encounter or a $100 encounter. She's going to have to return with $1,000 or risk death. And sometimes some of the things these girls describe to me are actually worse than death. They pray for death. So, yeah, that turns him into a great salesman. And when I told the man that, I, he was just baffled. In fact, he had a tear come down his cheek. He said, I just never understood it was like that. And I said, well, let me make it even clearer for you, sir. I said, if you and I go to an apartment complex here in this town and we knock on the door and a lady answers and we smile at her and we tell her she's going to need to smile or we're going to hurt her, we're going to beat her, we're going to do whatever we you know, threaten to do with her. And we take her back to her bedroom. We have sex with her, and we leave $100 on the nightstand. And we tell her to smile and be nice to us while we leave the apartment. I think we could all agree 
that that would, that would be rape by all definitions. And, and of course, that 74-year-old man, he just nodded his head. He said, you're, you're absolutely right. And another tear came down his cheek. Now, I don't know his past or how he was involved in this sort of thing in the past, and we didn't discuss it. It didn't matter because I was there to change his mind, change his heart. But what I needed him to understand is just because a young lady knocks on the door of your truck and, 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 and gives you the excuse that she's, I don't know, putting herself through law school, paying for a drug habit, you know, put, uh, rent, rent for a little bit of shelter for her children, whatever the lie is she's going to tell you, the reality is she's already been beaten and coerced and manipulated into that situation. And so effectually what you're doing is you're paying the pimp, you're paying the trafficker, even though you give the money to her, 100% of that money is going to be given to the pimp. So you are paying the pimp, the trafficker, the handler to rape the girl. That's what's happening in, in America. Prostitution really no longer exists, and I'll get to that in a minute. But just know that, that the lot lizard no longer exists. What, what you see on the, the tarmac, what you see there in the parking lot, is a female who is a sex slave. And that sex slave that you give money to is going to give it to a pimp, and you're going to have effectually paid the pimp to rape the girl. Now, how does that matter? Well, it matters because most men I've met are not rapists. And even in the lowest common denominator of our society, those who are in jail, when, when the fights break out in jail and the, the riots start, it's always the sex offenders, the rapists, that get you know, stabbed, shivved, beaten first. So even the lowest common denominator of our morality uh, here in our country understands that rape is wrong. And so those men understand it, and, and really every man that I talk to understands it. And so what I have to do, and it doesn't take too terribly long, no longer than we've talked tonight, to explain to him that it, what he's taking part in is non-consensual. And that if he continues to take part in it, no matter what lie that girl tells him that allows him to justify that it's going to be okay, the reality is always going to be 100% of the time let me change that, 99.9. .9. In seven years, I've met one consensual prostitute. The rest have all been trafficked. So I can't say 100% of the time, but what I am going to tell you is, and I do say it more often than not, 100% of the girls that are, that are out there right now that are offering services are being trafficked, you will be raping them. And it's just that simple. So if you're a rapist, keep doing what you're doing. And by the way, they, yes, there are rapists, and no, this doesn't work for rapists. But the reality is rapists are raping. They are not paying for sex. So we're not even talking about rapists. We're just talking about men. And it's every man. And it's not just truckers. And, and I get to pick on them because they make up the largest demand. But I, I pick on truckers a little bit uh, because it, it allows me to, to give a, a wonderful victory story. Because my trucks that have vigilantetrucker.com, uh, it's a website that leads you to vigilantetruth.com, the website that has all the videos and the education, and like I said, the tractor says stop the selling of rape. What actually happens when those trucks pull into a truck stop is the pimps see them, and the pimps will load the girls up and go away. So that truck stop, as long as my truck is parked there, becomes a no trafficking zone, which is amazing. It literally just stops it right in his tracks. Uh, it doesn't matter if the truck drivers and, and the other 100 trucks even know the truck's there or not. I mean, they're going to see it, and they might go to the website, and I might be able to educate somebody that way. Uh, but what's important is the traffickers see it. Because if you'll remember, those girls are making that trafficker $1,000 a day or $365,000 a year per girl. Average traffickers are going to have three to five. So we're talking about a guy who's making a million dollars but more importantly, he's got a $365,000 asset. The, the girl, he doesn't view her as human, by the way. She's, she's a product. She's an asset. And so the last thing he wants is his three or four girls that are working the truck stop, those assets, to be picked up by law enforcement. It's better for him just to disappear until that truck disappears. By the way, light always chases out darkness, doesn't it? God says it, and these trucks live it. They pull in. There's so much light and so much anointing. In fact, one of the visions I've gotten is, is uh, there's, there's always an uh, angel, huge angel, sits on the hood of every one of my trucks, straddles 
the front uh, grill area. It's got a big sword, and he just holds it, and he just sits up there. That's what I always see when, when I see my trucks pulling in places. Um, do my drivers, are they trained up? Yeah. Is that part of working for me? No. Do they all want to know about this and be a part of it? Yes. Have we rescued females out of truck stops using our trucks? Yes, we have. So we have great success stories there, but the, the, the greatest success is this. If I park my 10 trucks at all of the 10 truck stops that make up the, the Charlotte area, within a 30-mile radius of downtown Charlotte, there's 10 truck stops. So I park my trucks there 24-7, 365. Understand that I will have ended, absolutely ended, 50% of the trafficking in the eighth worst city in the country. Is that incredible or what? See, that's God comes up with plans like that. Nobody shoots at me. I didn't rescue anybody. I didn't try to steal a 365 asset from a pimp. And if you want to get into a gunfight, that's the quickest way to do it. I mean, my goodness, most of us that are going to be listening to this, uh, if somebody comes into our family room and tries to steal our $350 big screen off the wall, yours might be 500 and bigger than mine, but uh, you know, we're going to shoot them dead, leave them in the, in the living room. And actually, there's a law that says we can do that. So just imagine how you would fight for a $365,000 TV on your wall if somebody came in and tried to take it. So, you know, the gunfight, while, while we want to, is not necessarily the smartest way. Uh, the smartest way is to make sure that no trafficking can exist, and, and we can do that by fighting the demand. So as the truck stop breeds out, we've got no trafficking happening while it's there. We have other drivers that are getting educated. Perhaps company owners have seen, this, uh, seen the trucks. Newspaper reporters see the trucks. Shippers, receivers see the trucks. Law enforcement sees the trucks. So we get a huge amount of awareness and education out of them. Uh, so as minds are changing, maybe some of those people are calling, asking me to do something like tonight, which allows me to get in and actually change people's hearts. So the, the system of ending demand is we have to change the hearts of every consumer man that's purchasing these girls. We have to get them to understand mentally, yes, you're a rapist if you have sex with her. That's effective, but that's only a mental change. But that will buy us time, as do the trucks. Trucks are a no-trafficking zone. That buys us time to get to the mines. And then we talk about the fact that you'd be a rapist if you were with this girl and explain what sex trafficking slash prostitution looks like in the year 2018. And that buys us a little time to maybe I can get one-on-one -on -one with these guys, maybe at a driver's meeting one on 30, where I can really speak like I am tonight and really delve deep into somebody's heart and make a change there. Because when I've changed a guy's heart, well, by gosh, I know that he'll not be purchasing sex again. And that's the miracle of all this, and that's how God can operate. I'll tell you, as, uh, some of the fun things that we do focused at Vigilante Truth on the demand, not only do we have the trucks that are out in the truck stops, but we also are known to uh, uh, do these hotel stings where we uh, pretend to be a, a prostitute online and, and men are lured to the hotel, and a uh, female decoy will let them in and, go into the bathroom, kind of like if you've ever seen To Catch a Predator on TV uh, with Chris Hansen, uh, I guess that's about 10 years ago. But we do the similar thing, but I'm not law enforcement, so that we're not there to arrest anybody, and, and uh, it's 100% ministry. And, yes, I said earlier I do work with law enforcement uh, because we're good at it, <laughs> but uh, nine times out of ten we're actually just doing it 100% as a ministry, and nobody's getting arrested. But what's happening is, I'll go in and educate that man, and you can imagine when I come out of the bathroom, he's, he's trying to decide you know, what's going on. So I explain it to him. I explain that we're not law enforcement. I explain that I'm not there to hurt him in any way. I explain that I'm there to explain to him that he's a rapist. And I spend about 15 minutes doing that. Uh, but what happens after that is I like to start building the guy back up. And that's a weird thing to say. Uh, it was weird the first time it happened. Um, now it's, it's second nature and it makes perfect sense because this is how God operates. But I build that guy up for a little while. And then I let him know that I don't think he's a rapist. I think he was just ignorant to what he was doing. And then I let him know that while I am there to free the girl, the reality is I'm there to free the man. And, and these men are, are self-medicating with the commercial sex trade, whether it's loneliness or some kind of trauma from their past, uh, I've heard many a story sitting in those hotel rooms knee-to-knee -knee with these guys. 
but what what I found is they're broken, and they need their heart not only changed, but they need their heart healed. And so we spend the next 30 minutes, because I usually go through about a guy an hour, but we spend the next 30 minutes allowing Jesus to come into those men's hearts and, uh, and change them and heal them, because I know when that's there, they'll never be in those hotels again. And so once again, we've just sat back and watched what I call it, like I just call it, it's so Jesus, because I have in my hands their entire lives. I, Bo, a human, have in my hands the lives of this man. I know his, his name, his phone number. I know where he works. I know his social media. I know where he lives. I know his wife's name. Seven out of ten of them are always married. Uh, I, know th- I know his children's name. I might even know where he goes to church. Um, and and he, it doesn't matter. I've had 18-year-old high school seniors all the way up to 72, uh, excuse me, 70 year old Methodist organ players. I've had every race, nationality sit before me black, Latino, white, Asian, Indian. Um, it's just amazing all the broken men that exist in our country. And so I have their lives right in my hand because I'm taping it all on video. And, and they're one click away from being in front of my 500,000 Facebook followers. And what I simply do to them is say, you know, Jesus showed me grace. And Jesus set you and I up for a divine appointment tonight. It's really important right now for you to recognize that. And it's really important for you to understand that I'm giving you your life back just like he gave me mine. Because I was never any better than any of those men. And so what that last 30 minutes ends up being is a, a broken man gaining healing, being prayed over. And uh, I can tell you, many a man hits his knees and starts to bawl like, like, like babies. And not because they're going to get arrested, because they're not. And not because I'm going to expose them, because I'm not. They're crying because they've been healed and freed from the pain that they've been self-medicating. And you know what that cost me? And, then, and my team's made up of 100% volunteers. So it cost me nothing. Maybe a motel room. <laughs> Sometimes the guys will leave us enough money that they were going to pay the girls. They'll make a donation. We don't ask for it, but they, <laughs> more often than not, God will provide the cost of the motel room via these guys. Um, but it costs me nothing. You know, I receive freely and, and I give freely, but lives are changed. And, and so that is the demand side. Uh, to wrap one of my trucks is $2,000. And in the scheme of things, that's not a whole lot of money either when you're talking about $100,000 to, for one year to, for, a, for a victim restoration or, or to keep her up. So I hope that, as I've cruised along here for the last 50 minutes, that I've given you an understanding of what we face here in our country, that I've given you an understanding of how only focusing on one side or another um, can can you know, cause a problem, uh, we, and, and rightly so, we should not all be focused just on demand, right? So uh, it's great that God has, has uh, fabric, uh, put the fabric together and he's weaving us all together so that uh, there are groups out there that are focused on supply, and there are groups out there that are focused on rescue, and there are groups out there that are focused on demand, and we're going to end trafficking in the United States because of, because of his kingdom plan to do this, and why well, I just give him praise and worship him for that, and my goodness, um, to understand what he's doing and and the horrors of this are are, are simply, this is overwhelming. It's just overwhelming. Uh, People always want to hear a couple of terrible stories. So if there's uh, some kids on the line, you might want to, if they're under under 13 or 14, you might want to let them go do something else for a few minutes. But I want to use some terms with you uh, in these stories so that you get an understanding uh, of what it can really look like. Um, the first story is going to involve a young lady. Um, her father started sexually abusing her at a young age, and so the foster care system took her over. And um, unfortunately, foster care is a breeding ground for traffickers. Uh, it, it's it's terrible from from all issues and. Um, We've, we've heard stories, we being American citizens, have heard stories about stepfathers and foster fathers doing terrible things to girls. 
Um, but this particular story is about a, a foster mother. And the foster mother was actually, had taken this girl and was trafficking the girl. So I, I want to, you know, I want to expand your mind a little bit. You know, I always tell people don't put God in a box, and, and I would tell you not to put trafficking in a box because anytime we put something in a box, we are limiting ourselves to our field of vision. And so if you're only out there looking for the boogie bad man pimp with the gold tooth and the, the fur hat and cane, you have missed out on the the trafficker that that is wearing a thousand dollar suit, gray haired, married, and has three kids. You don't want to miss out on either one of those two guys. So to understand that, yes, uh, of the traffickers, sex traffickers here in our country, only 60% of them are males. And then you have 35% are females. And then 5% are couples. What's it look like for a couple? A couple will actually move into a rental house in a nice neighborhood and I don't mean like million-dollar neighborhood. I mean like the neighborhood right across the street from you and where all the kids go to school every day. And they will take one of their trafficked children and intro those children or that ch child, excuse me, into the high school. And that child is manipulated enough to recognize somebody else that can be manipulated. And she'll invite that young lady over for a uh, spend-the-night party, a little sleepover. They still do that. The difference between a sleepover party or an invite-over party uh, when I was young to now is when I was young, my mom and dad walked me in the house and met the parents and made sure that I was going to be safe before I ever stepped foot in that house. Now kids get dropped off. The parents don't ever walk in. In fact, even the next day, a parent's just going to text from the driveway, I'm here, and, and the, the, the young lady will walk out. But what's happened in between getting dropped off and, and the home not being checked out when I mean checked out, a, a trafficker's home's not even going to have pictures on the wall, right, because they're going to be looking to move quick. So it's not going to be a permanent setting. There's not going to be anything in the refrigerator, things of that nature. Uh, the parents aren't going to have a real story. Nothing's going to fit together. The, the daughter's not going to have any kind of life story growing up. So, I mean, there's plenty of things that, that a parent, if they really care, is going to be able to determine that their daughter and son should not spend the night there. But for those parents who don't take the time, that little girl is going to be drugged and raped all night on film, and she's going to be threatened in the morning when she comes to. She's going to be shown the films, and she's going to be told that those will be up on Facebook if she does not start answering her text to be at hotels. And so she's actually going to start being trafficked at area hotels, and she's going to have told her mom and dad or single parent that she's on her way to the library or a football game or basketball game, but what she's really headed to is a hotel, and 100% of that money is going to go back to that pimp. And the reality is, if we'll all remember back to when we were 13, 14, 15 years old, we could be easily influenced by things like that. In fact, kids are killing themselves over a little bit of bullying now. So you can only imagine what a child in a life-or-death situation would feel like at that age to see rape videos and have those rape videos be threatened to sh shown to her parents, to her friends, to her family to the world, yeah, she's going to do exactly what that, that, that trafficker says. So that's what a couple can look like. And by the way, I'm telling you 100% real stories that I've come in contact with. Um, so you have a female that can be trafficking. You can have a couple that can be a trafficker. You can have a man that is a trafficker. Um, it, it, it's just, it, it looks like everything. So you need to be aware for everything. There is a, a term, human trafficking. So what is, why, I've been talking really a lot tonight about sex trafficking, sex slavery, because that's our main focus at Vigilante Truth. But as a country, we have a human trafficking problem. And so 80% of the trafficking, by definition, in our country is sex. And so that's why you hear a lot about it, and that's why a lot of money is going to it. And the reality is if my daughter gets raped versus works a 16-hour day, I'm more apt to be upset about her being raped, right? So that's the reality of it. But there are people... Um, nannies, uh, nail salons, um, agricultural, you know, farm hands, um, whether that's growing something or animal care, um, those people are being brought into the country and, and or found in this country. They're being put to work and they're not being paid either. And so they're living in slavery. And, and I tell people all the time since, you know, we're American, I'm from the South, it doesn't matter whether you're picking cotton or 
on your back on a mattress if it is a commercial business and you are not getting paid, it's slavery. If somebody else gets all the money, it's slavery. So that's what human trafficking is on, on, on the labor side. Um, and, and so you, you can be shocked by that. Uh, again, you know, some people care, some people don't. I wish more people did. But the reality is it can blend. We had a hotline call from a, a young man, and uh, we went to facilitate getting him rescued. And this young man was, had, had been running down the street naked. He was uh, 20 years old. He was Asian. He had been brought into the country. He was forced to work at a Chinese buffet restaurant in the kitchen. And after his 12-hour shift working in the kitchen, he was taken back to a house. Um, he was locked, literally chained and locked naked in a room. And throughout the night, he would be taken from that room and sold to, uh, to men who wanted to have sex with him. Um, that was his lifestyle for the better part of six months. And at some point, he was able to uh, get free of the chains. I, I won't go into the exact details, but he was able to get out of the chains, get out of the window, and run down the street uh, screaming for help. And somebody you know, got him and gave us a call. So that's what labor trafficking, there's, there's, that's, a, that's a, uh, the only perfect example I truly have of labor example of, of labor trafficking uh, that, that lends itself right into sex trafficking. Um, we actually were able to, uh, to, to find out, again, where, where he had that house, and, and there was a number of, of men rescued, but that was a, it was a big organization, uh, and it was a big deal. Um, but it was right in, in suburbia. It was right out in front of everybody. So uh, another thing to look at. Um, so those are, those are some stories. And I'll give you one last one uh, because it involves vigilante truth. And I would made mention that we would had, uh, had some girls rescued with our trucks. And so I'll give you one of those stories to know what that can look like on the road and out, out really in the, in the trenches. Um, I love my drivers. Again, I, I wish I, I always thought. Here was, here was the original uh, Bo's business plan for fighting trafficking was, God, send me an army of born-again, spirit-filled, supernatural, demon-slaying drivers, and we're going to take over the world, and we'll end this trafficking in the first six months. And what he sent me was a bunch of felons, sinning, dark, broken men. <laughs> I didn't realize humanity could be that bad. Um, but the reality was uh, I've been able to speak into all those guys' lives, and even more importantly is, for, for a lot of them, for the first time in their lives, they're a part of something good. And so while I can't tell you that I, that I have 16 drivers today that, that, are, that are chasing after God with a hunger, I can tell you that all 16 of these drivers are, are seeing the image of Christ. They're seeing the grace, um, and, and they're actually able to share that grace, and they get a taste of it. And uh, so we do see some, some changes. But this one driver in, in particular would come through that story, and uh, he just really bought in to what we were doing at Vigilante Truth. Uh, he, has, he has a sister and he has a mother, and, and he can relate to that. And he, he has met some bad people and that would you know, be pimps and traffickers, and so he understands what that looks like. And he's seen the destruction on some girls through that. So um, while he might have been a part of it in another life, he's, he's no longer a part of it. And he, he actually is one of the one of the few that have found Christ. And, and, and so long and short is, he was at a truck stop, and a, a girl came up to him and, and said, I need help. Now, he and I had had enough conversations that he knew he wasn't allowed to let that girl in his truck because you never know when you're going to be set up either. But uh, he got me on the phone, and he handed the girl the phone, and I asked her enough questions to know that it was a legitimate situation. And they were up in Pennsylvania, and I just said, well, you know, go ahead and, and turn the truck south and head on back here to Charlotte and bring her to us, and, and we'll get her some help. And she agreed to that. Uh, she was actually out of uh, the Colorado area. And so that you understand what this can look like, um, how did she get from Colorado to PA? Because from PA to Charlotte is a great story, and from Charlotte on is an even better story. But how did she get from Colorado to PA? That's the story we all really need to pay attention to. She was, on Friday, dropped off 
at her boyfriend's drug dealer's house. She didn't realize her boyfriend had a, a drug habit, a meth habit. We don't know how he hit it. Uh, it hadn't been that long of a relationship. But what happened is the man couldn't pay his bills, couldn't pay his, his drug dealer, and so he literally dropped his girlfriend off as payment for his drug habit. And that drug dealer spent Friday night and Saturday and Sunday beating her and raping her and on Monday, loaded her into his car, and he said, I'm going to take you to a place where hoes die. She still to this day does not know what city that was that they were headed to, but that's what he said, and he put her in the car, and off they went. And amazingly enough, Monday afternoon on an interstate, his car breaks down. And as he pulls over on the side of the road, he gives her an opportunity to jump out of the car and run down the street in nothing but the clothes she has on her back, no wallet, no phone, no nothing, just the clothes on her back. But she runs down the road, and a truck picks her up, not one of mine, but another truck. She explains what's happened to that truck driver, and he drives to a truck stop, and she's going into the bathroom to gather herself up, and he pulls away. And I get that because, you know, if you're hearing that story for the first time from a young lady who is, I'm sure, frantic um, and beat up and you're scared that, you know, the guy's going to get his car running and track you down, there's all kinds of fear the devil plays with in this arena. But he pulled off. And so when she came out of the bathroom, he was gone, but my truck was there. So she was able to walk up to my truck and and and, and, and get some help. Now, the thing about that young lady is she had never been trafficked before. She, this was not a part of her life. She was totally outside of this. She didn't see it coming. And yet she was caught up in it 100%. And then a lot of times when I'm speaking and if I bring this story up, I ask the audience, what, what age would you tell me this, this, this female is? And, and because I bring up 13 a lot, I'll, I'll get 12s and 13s, 14s and 16s and 18s. This was a white woman with all of her teeth, pretty, nice hair, smart. She was 32 years old, 32. So it... it, it it can. I, you know, we talked about it a couple times tonight. It, it's every girl out there. And it's every girl out there on the supply side because it's every guy out there on the demand side. Sure, there is a guy who's willing to pay $20 for a girl, and he's going to get what $20 would buy him. She might have her teeth, might not. She might be all drugged up, she might not. Most likely she has no teeth and she's drugged up. You know, you follow me. But there's going to be an executive who can afford to pay $1,000 for a girl, and he's going to ask for all of her teeth to be there, maybe even college educated, and he might be willing to pay $2,000, $2,500, $5,000, $10,000 for a supermodel, right? Because he can and he will. And that's what he wants to purchase. Some people buy beater cars and some people buy Ferraris, right? It's the same thing. So it's every girl, just because you don't think you live in the inner cities, that you're safe, you're not. Because there's a man in your neighborhood that's paying for sex. One out of five men, one out of five, that's 20% of, our, of the men in our country. But one out of five men admits to having sex, commercial sex. One out of five. How many men live in your neighborhood? How many men live in your city? How many men live in your state? I said there was 500,000 girls out there tonight that are victims, and they're going to have to be with 15 men. That's 7.5 million men today, just today, because most guys aren't doing this every day, doing it once a week. But 500,000 times 15 is $7.5 million. And if it's once a week, let's multiply that times seven. That's 52.5 million men. That's crazy that have admitted to commercial sex. So understanding that how, how different economically, again, racially, um, you pick at age, it, it doesn't matter. It's every man out there is going to purchase what he wants to purchase, what he likes. So that means there has to be a fitting female for every one of those. And that's the reality of why 
twenty percent of the trafficked girls in our country are from out of the country because that would be some of these men's exotic fantasies would be a South American girl, an Asian girl, an Eastern Bloc girl, right? Anything that you think about is going to be demand oriented. They move these girls from city to city to city, you'll hear that. Why? Well, it's because of the demand. If I'm a buying customer and I'm going to a massage parlor once a week, after three weeks, I'm going to want a different girl there. I mean, my goodness, I'm married. If I wanted to have sex with the same girl, I, I just have sex with my wife. That's a reality, right? So they've got to move these girls from city to city because they have to bring new to the customer. Again, it's demand-driven. I can't say it enough to get everybody to understand. If you want to stop this, we've got to get to the hearts of the broken men who are self-medicating with these girls. So that's, uh, that's 101, trafficking 101. Maybe I, I, I went into trafficking 202 a little bit. Um, but I, I think I've probably given you enough to, to break your hearts. I hope that I have. Um, but it, if I get an opportunity, and, and Paul, you let me know, uh, an opportunity like this, it seems like uh, if we break in some hearts, we need to give an opportunity to heal some hearts. Does that make sense to you? Amen, amen. Well, I'll tell you what, I know we got a lot of questions. I know I have a lot of questions. Uh, one of the questions I have is as, uh, you know, the regular type of guy out here that is not getting involved in this type of uh, lifestyle, you know, how do we recognize what's going on around us? But if I can, if we can uh, take a uh, short break uh, when we come back, if uh, we could get into some of them questions, I'd certainly appreciate it. Absolutely. I'll, I'll answer until you quit asking. <laughs> Okay, that sounds real good. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. We would like to invite you to tune in to Smokehouse Studios Front Porch Show. We're live Saturday evenings at 6 p.m. Central Time. We discuss current events and Bible prophecy and how it all relates into the days that we find ourselves in today. You can find Smokehouse Studios Front Porch Show by searching for it on iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, and Spreaker Radio. We also invite you to tune in to our website at SmokehouseStudios.net. There you can click the radio show link, and on the radio show page, there is a player there to hear our shows as well. They do podcasts, so you can go back into the archives and listen to our past shows. Tune in. Saturday evenings at 6 p.m. Central Time. For all of those that would like to be uh, to participate in tonight's uh, message, this uh, talking about this situation that is growing, and as we've seen, is is very uh, tragic. Uh, the number to call in would be 641-715-0689. And they'll ask for an access code, say six three three nine seven, and then the pound sign. Again, I'll repeat that number. It's six four one seven one five zero six eight nine, with an access code of eight six three three nine seven, and then the pound sign. You know, again, uh, the question that really well, there's a lot of questions that are coming out of me, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to monopolize this because I know there's quite a few callers on. But, uh, you know, how do we recognize that? You know, a lot of us being in the trucking industry and you, you know, owning trucks, you understand, you know, we're 100 mile an hour all the time, you know, getting fuel, running inside, getting receipts, cup of coffee, at the bathroom, right back up, back down on the road. You know, we walk past a lot of this stuff that's going on, and it's totally, uh, you know, Greek to us. We don't understand it, and we don't see it. What do we look for? Well, you, normally you don't have to look too hard. I mean, as you guys know on the road, uh, when you're parked, you're going to get a knock on the door. In fact, if I, if I ever have a driver that moves from one of my, uh, my older trucks into a new truck and I haven't wrapped it yet, he wants to know how quick the truck is going to be wrapped because he wants to be able to go back to sleep because the girls won't come up and approach our trucks um, for fear of, of reprisal. But if, if other than just saying no when they, they knock on the door, let me tell you what a sex trafficked female uh, cannot do. A sex trafficked female cannot speak for herself. She's not allowed to speak for herself. She is under the total control of her pimp. So 
Um, yes, she can speak when she comes up to you know to offer sex, but just standing. If if you see, in fact, guy, you know, I tell guys all the time, if you see a female standing at a truck stop, there's no reason for her to be there. Um, if she's dressed provocatively at all, there's no reason for her to be there. Pimps have gotten a little smarter now. A girl is going to be wearing jeans and, and boots and a hoodie. But still, you know, you guys know the difference between a driver and a female, right? Or a female driver. You know the difference between a female driver and a female at a truck stop. Are there girlfriends that meet their boyfriends at truck stops? Yes, but rarely. When you see a female, something is, is amiss. Um, so, and I'm talking on the truck side of the parking lot, necessarily, not necessarily the, you know, the front where the public's at. Back at the showers, most 100% definitely there's no reason for a female to be back at the showers. So um, the easiest thing to do is strike up a very, very casual conversation with her. Ask her how she's doing. That You might not get a response out of that. Uh, now, that response to how are you doing might be, you know, she's going to go into business mode. Ask her where she's from. You know, how long has she lived there? Uh, just some really basic questions. And, and that, uh, you know, she might not know her address. Uh, if she's a, a minor, if you can feel like she's, you know, she's a younger girl, she won't know her address. Oh, where are you from? Georgia. Oh, really, where in Georgia? Uh, she might not even know she's in Atlanta, right? How can, a, how can a girl not know she's in Atlanta when you're in Atlanta at a truck stop, right? So, right. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm from Atlanta. Oh, really? I, I, I love Atlanta. I come through here all the time. Uh, you know, what part of Atlanta do you live in? Uh, if you don't know Shambly versus, you know, some other part, like Kennesaw or, you know, a, 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 we all learn our addresses when we're four and five years old in, you know, kindergarten. That's what we're taught. So if you've got a, a teenager or a young adult that can't even tell you where they live or where they're from in a credible way, there's a, there's, it's a great sign. It's a great issue. Now, if it's a male and a female and you, you just get a gut check, uh, what is this female doing with this guy? That whole picture just doesn't, you know, or the Holy Spirit just convicts you, checks you up a little bit, and you turn around and look and strike up the same conversation. Say, hey, how you doing? If she doesn't speak at all and he does all the speaking, something's wrong with that situation. Now, she could be shy. So form a question, a casual question, just directly to her. You know, how do you like riding in the truck? She's not going to be allowed to answer at all. She's totally under his control and manipulation. And you're going to sense that. That's the easiest way. That's, that's how I, I recognize trafficking. That is the number one tool that I use because I'm, a, you know, gosh, I've been talking now for an hour and some change. I can talk. So, and listen, I never met a trucker that couldn't talk. So, you know, striking up those casual conversations there that you guys are so good at, if you're not getting any real answers back from the female, it's most likely an issue. Uh, okay, that's you know the days of the thigh high boots and the short short mini skirts. And now I see that stuff, so I mean it still exists. But I mean, the, as we nonprofit organizations and and law enforcement are getting smarter about this, the pimps are having to get smarter. And so you know they are going to 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 ways that they're not just throwing it out there like they used to, as far as advertising and marketing goes. You know, keeping it as a business term. Um, but listen, we got a bunch of faith-based people on this call. You need to uh, to listen for the Holy Spirit to convict you as to what's going on, and based on that conviction, open your mouth and ask some questions. And if you don't feel good about it, take it another step. I mean, it, it's nothing to to say something to a manager. A lot of the truck stops, especially in the evenings, are going to have some kind of security there. Um, so it's nothing wrong with, with walking up to a guy and going, hey, man, I just I don't feel good about this situation. Do you mind going over there and having a conversation with him? So the worst thing, what's the worst thing that's going to happen is a boyfriend or a father is going to find out that somebody cares about their daughter and just wants to make sure she's okay. Should that upset them? I don't think so. Right. You right. Know? So uh, that's, that's the, the best way. Now, if you get really up on this, you're going to recognize tattoos because pimps will brand the girls with tattoos so that other pimps know who they belong to. Um, those tattoos will be visible. Now, they might be up on the back of the neck, kind of at the hairline. They're going to be on wrists, forearms, hidden but not hidden. Um, so, uh, you know, I love to just walk up to a girl and go, hey, this is the coolest tattoo. I don't have any tattoos. I'm an old, old man, but I'm thinking about getting a tattoo for my 60th birthday. What do you, you know, where'd you get your tattoo? 
and you will watch. You can watch your eyes, and you know some people go, "Oh, I got it at such and such and such," and I'd always want it. Really, what's what's that star mean? Oh, I, it's for my mother. You know, they, they, somebody's always a story to it. But if you ask a girl what her tattoo is, and she turns white on you, and doesn't know where she got it because her pimp actually did it to her, right? And she doesn't have a story to go with it. Um, those are that's another those those two things: conversation and tattoos. Wonderful way to find out if a girl's being trafficked, specifically at a truck stop or a rest area. I'll be darned. I wouldn't even know, you know, the conversation. I, I can see, but, you know, you wouldn't think that. And because we don't think about it that much, that they actually, these girls are branded. Sure. You know, they're, they're cattle. Who is a brand? Yeah. That's amazing. We're still, we still see them as human, and we should. We're the good guys, right? But the bad guys do not see them as human. Uh, you know, and, and real, the reality is our culture in America doesn't see, see them as human, and I'll prove this to you. I have a, a rescue dog, Molly, and, and, and I always tell people, or people say that, Bo, you rescued her, and I say, no, no, actually she rescued me. But the reality is if I take Molly and I hook a chain to her leash and I hook the end of that leash to the bumper of my truck and I drag her down the street, I'm going to be charged with a felony, a felony uh, animal cruelty. Now, my lovely wife, who uh, we're high school sweethearts, we've been together for almost 35 years now, if I take the same leash and put it around her neck or, uh, and, and attach the same chain to it and I pull her down the street with my same truck, do you realize I'm only going to be charged with a felony? I'm sorry, excuse me, a misdemeanor. I'll only be charged with a misdemeanor. So even culturally, <laughs> we're not getting this right. Things have just got to change. We just have to understand uh, what's really before us. Amen. Well, the floor is open. If anybody else has any questions, any comments, feel free to jump in here. I've got a question. Um, you've been in this for how long now? Uh, over six years. Under seven, but, but uh, full six. Have you thought about uh, expanding to a different area? Um, and the reason why I'm asking, I've got a family member that moved to uh, Portland, Oregon to, to go to school there. And this person started <clears throat> working for an uh, organization there that uh, focused on human trafficking up and down I-5, mm -hmm. you know, Washington, Oregon, and California. California, sure. And, yeah, and... The stories that this person told me is just, I mean, it's like yours. I mean, it's its its hard to grasp. I mean, you know, the the girls that the, they would uh, help, they would get them into a, uh, their own place, help them get a job and stuff like that. But, you know, some of them went back to doing what they was doing, you know. 80%, here's a stat for you, 80% exactly. of right. the rescued victims go back into the life. Go back, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, Why and is that? Oh, I don't no. know. We don't have the don't services. Uh, we, we don't have the proper care. Um, right. is, I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, sharing this message at a church, and we'll have an altar call after the fact for healing, and I'll have women come up to me. Uh, and I use the term women, so I'm, I'm talking all ages, right? Teenage, girls, teenagers, uh, ladies, women. But I'll have females come up to me and ask me to pray to heal their two, three, four personalities. I've had a woman come up to me and ask me to pray for all 100 of her personalities. I, what I didn't know in the beginning and, and what is just is still to this day is impossible to understand is how damaged these girls are, how split and fractured this trauma has, right. has, has, you know, has just ruined them. It, it's, when I, 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 even, I hate to say this publicly, but I, I haven't been able to figure out how to get the point across in any other way. I affectionately call these girls nuclear garbage, nuclear waste. It, it's, it's, you know, we have a regular landfill waste, and we, we just put it in a landfill, cover it with a piece of plastic, and drive over with a bulldozer, and we're done. It's a new park where we can walk our dogs in 10 years. But, but you know, there's, there's nuclear waste in our country that we just, can't put it just anywhere, and we really don't know what to do with it other than putting a 50 valve gallon drum and, and hope it doesn't leak. This is so new to our community 
uh, it's not new to God. And, and man, I, I'll tell you what, of the 20% that do not go back into the life, I'm going to tell you that 19% of those, God has intervened and, and just radically, miraculously healed these girls from the inside. Um, right. But we are still not prepared as, as a culture in America because it is so new. You know, we, our counselors, and I'm talking, you know, worldly counseling, psychiatrists, they don't really understand the full potential or, or full damage of what's happened yet. So, and, and the beds aren't there, you know. So, uh, you know, the last thing one of these girls really needs is to be in a bedroom with two or three other girls. Well, that's, that's where I just came from, right? Or we don't have a house for them to go to in Oregon, so we'll just keep them in a hotel for a couple of weeks until we can find a house. Maybe Bo's got an empty one in North Carolina. We can send them there. Well, these girls are all of a sudden in, in a hotel room. You know, that's not the best place to keep them either. Um, so we have a family maybe then that's going to volunteer as a foster care uh, for a few weeks instead of the hotel so we can get them into a full-time situation. Well, this girl just got trafficked in foster care, so that's not the healthy place to put her. So there's a, a huge amount of problems. We're going to overcome them all. Everybody's going to get better. There are a number of organizations nationwide that are really grasping what's going on and, and doing a great job. Um, as far as to, to answer the first part of your question, sir, um, vigilante truth, we go, I go, wherever God invites us to go. So, we, uh, you know, and the, period. End of story, and I don't charge. So uh, uh, if somebody calls me from Oregon and wants me there next week, I'm hopping a plane and we're going. Um, I just follow God's lead on, on all of this. Um, so he's going to grow this as, as he wants to grow it. Um, the, the country's just figuring out that fighting it supply only is not necessarily the full and best way to do it. And so they're starting to understand, and that's organizations that, that are restoring the girls. I, I um, am part of the, the leadership team here in Charlotte that makes up six organizations. I'm the demand side, and the other five organizations are all on the, the restoration side. And, and the founders of those organizations are constantly asking me when I'm going to end trafficking. <laughs> they're overwhelmed. Um, but I speak with them on a regular basis because they're talking about one side of the coin. I get to play with the edge and the other side of the coin. So um, I do work with and am available to grow it as fast and as prudent as God would want to see it grown. Amen. Amen. Now, I interrupted you. Did you have some uh, a second part to that question? Yeah. Well, I figure, you, you know, you probably know pretty much what I'm talking about out that way. Uh I do. Well, I mean, it, yeah, I, I didn't know if there's anybody that's doing something like you over there already, you know. But uh, There's not. Um, that's well, yeah. the, I, there's no one in the country, and I don't say this arrogantly or prideful at all. I wish there was a thousand bows out there. But right now, right. Vigilante Truth is the only demand-focused nonprofit organization in our country. Um I get invited to, to speak to different groups. I think that there are men, let me tell you, here's the quick, easy answer. The last thing that a traffic girl wants to see is a man. Uh, you're going to have to have a special anointing of God as a father figure um, that those girls can see God through you for you even to get in their space, right? So if I can't help out at the house and there's no sense in rescuing because there's nowhere to put them, what can a man do, right? Um, so at Vigilante Truth, we, we do form these teams. We do some undercover work um, in the hotels. We do undercover work at adult massage parlors. Uh, it, you guys drive by these signs. If you see the word spa, and it's got Asian spa or Oasis spa or Happy Day spa, whatever kind of spa you're going by, and it's got a billboard on the highway, which, by the way, these places are blatantly illegal. They're whorehouses, but they got billboards. Go figure. It's our country. We'll work it out. Um, but every one of those places, every one of the girls in them are sex trafficked. Um, so, how, how, you know, what can a man do? Well, we actually go out and uh, we'll just do surveillance on the places 24 hours a day for, you know, a week. And we'll bring in all the pictures and give them to law enforcement so they can go and get the places closed down. So those are kind of some of the things that, that we do that some other groups might not want to do. Um, maybe their wives aren't going to let them go out and play with that kind of risk. I will tell you, I've never been threatened. Not verbally, not in emails, not with texts, not on Facebook. Uh, I've never had any kind of weapons pointed at me, not in any work I've ever done. 
I'm telling you, God has got his hand in this. He's got his army in this. His angels are in this. Jesus is all about it. And uh, he's got fire shooting out, out of his eyes about it. And 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 the, the safety that we walk in, and I think everybody fighting trafficking, if you're doing it wisely, you're going to find that fighting it via demand is, is almost boring um, in the fact that if, if, if you think you're there for an adrenaline kick. Um, but having said that, what, you know, what else can, can men do? Well, we can quit listening to what I call glory stories, and, and not the glory stories I talk about where God's operating supernaturally, but the glory stories where I'm going to tell you about the last trophy girl that I had sex with. And we're going to be sitting at a place having a Subway sandwich, or we're going to be sitting at a place having a cold beer, or we're going to be in a locker room, or we're going to be on the phone driving down the road in our trucks, and we're going to be sharing these kind of stories because that's what guys do. And if you can learn to say, hey, man, I just don't want to hear that, they're going to say why, and you're going to be able to tell them because, you know, it leads to X, Y, and Z. 80%, here's, a, here's a fact. 80% of all the porn that's being watched in our country, 80% of those actresses are being sex trafficked. So if you're watching porn, you are feeding into the sex trafficking industry. Although I don't watch porn, and this is a phone call of, of all Christian men. Well, let me tell you what, I operate in churches a lot, and I'm, I'm the one that the pastors call to go speak to the broken men. And so I can tell you that half of the men in church today are watching porn at least monthly, if not weekly. So, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's inbred into our culture. It's inbred into our church. Um, so a great place to say is I'm not going to watch any more porn and I don't want to talk to you about watching any porn and here's why. And you've learned enough tonight to, to say, hey, I don't want to be a part of sex trafficking and feed into sex trafficking at all. Um, so that's, that's another thing men can do is just stand up and say, you know what, God created man and he created women. Now, I'll, I'll end your question, <laughs> my answer uh, yes. with this. When he created a man, he gave a man nothing but strengths. The man had no weakness. And then he created a woman, and a woman had only strengths, no weaknesses. And then those two were paired together to go out and conquer the world. And that was Adam and Eve. And they were inside the garden doing what they do, and that was what they were set up. To. And when they got kicked out of the garden, Adam's strengths became Eve's weaknesses. And Eve's strengths became Adam's weaknesses. And all of a sudden, you have them battling each other because now we're in a selfish society, selfish culture, right? And so because Adam is physically stronger, he gets to actually take over the female. And we've seen that throughout all history since that, that very moment, right? I, I don't care who the girl is. I don't care what weapon she has. You give me 20 minutes with her in a small room, and I will win because I'm a man, and she's a female, and that's just what it is. So all of, I, I will overcome all of her strengths with my strengths. And so as men, we have to recognize the value of God's creation. It's called female, and she's perfect. And she has every strength that we will need. That My wife has every strength that Bo will need to conquer the world. right? But if I don't treat her like she's priceless... If I treat her like she can be manipulated, if I treat her, if I overcome what God has made good in her, and I'm not talking physically, but, but is she an artist? Is she going to be a nurse? Is she going to be a president? Is she an organizer? Uh, does she have the ability to, to teach? Does she have the ability to, to run a corporation? Listen, on my corporations, I always infused them with women because they get it done, right? So if, if we downgrade all that and we reduce it all the way down to a $100 sex act. We take a priceless female and reduce her to $100. My God, I do not want to have to be responsible to have that conversation with my God. I just don't. So what can a man do? A man can learn to recognize females for their priceless value, teach it to other men by not allowing men to devalue women in their presence. That will go a long way creating a, a total new culture for men, total new culture for men. Mm -hmm. Laying off the porn is just another way to self-medicate an issue. Go, go and get your healing and, and, and just get off the glory stories with your buddies.
<laughs> you, you said something about spreading across the uh, the country, and uh, and I'll tell you nothing nothing. If a man is on the East Coast and needs to get a message to the West Coast, he needs to talk to a trucker on the East Coast and let that man get on his CB. Because right. right. be in an hour, they'll be hearing about it on the West Coast. So mm-hmm. there's an army of men out there called truckers that can make such a dent in this. And there's another organization, uh, TAT. Truckers Against Trafficking, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of them. Their only focus is how do we recognize it and then call law enforcement. Um, at Vigilante Truth, you know, tr- we have vigilante truckers, we have vigilante golfers, vigilante bikers, vigilante travelers. You, know, you can be all the vigilante you want to be. But as far as the trucking industry, we'd like to take it a step further and really go after the educating of, of the root problem. Not, you know, the, the fruit on the tree is the girl walking in the truck stop. Um, we want to get down to the root problem so that that fruit never grows, and that's what we focus on from that standpoint. I was wondering if um, Truckers Against Trafficking, are, are they a faith-based organization? I know I've, I've heard of them, and, and, and um, uh, I've never researched them, but are, are they faith-based as but they are not faith-based in their founding. I, I, I'm sure there are faith-based volunteers within their organization. Right. Um, but no, they, I, I don't think that, that as an organization they claim to be faith-based. Okay, not like you are. Not like you are. Yeah, we, we go God first. I'm only here Amen. because he sent me. Amen. Uh, my pastor, uh, he um, just joined an organization, and him and his wife took off to... Uh, uh, Patea, Thailand, which is one of the number one That's places terrible. in the world, the darkest yes. uh, place in the world. Mm-hmm. And he's with an organization called Exodus Road. Yes. Which is not a faith-based organization either, but maybe he's he's to bring some of that into their organization. Who knows what God's plan is for him. But, oh, oh, absolutely. So yeah, I always any organization that's doing good is doing good, right? I mean, you, you can't argue that. Yeah. They uh, they might right. not understand where the, um, the 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 true passion that's been created in their hearts is coming from, um, but yeah, you know, Tat's a great organization. They have done a super job of bringing uh, raw, basic awareness to the trucking industry and really the transportation industry. Um, they've done a great job of going out and getting sponsors. Um, you know, and getting pilots and flying jays and loves and you know some really big sponsors across the country. They do a great job at that. So they're taking, they're they're handling. While they might not be faith based, they are handling a lot of the workload for me. So I'm not complaining at all. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, I, I my pastor and his wife are over there right now, and uh, that's that's he goes into the brothels and bars and whatever undercover yeah. and. They uh, gather information for uh, for the local police, and and uh, they, you know, uh, and when you were going to tell a few stories, um, you know, I know you've probably got many more that are worse than what you told, but I've heard some pretty pretty nasty stuff from him, you know, in the last year that he's been over there, and and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, six year old girls and boys, how how could one even think? I, yeah, I, I, I don't think about having sex with them. I, yeah. I couldn't, I can't comprehend anything that evil. I still, to this day, haven't seen it and lived it and heard of it, and I still continue. And, and I'm, I'm glad that I am this way. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the greeter at my church, right? I'm, I'm always upbeat. Um, <laughs> I just yep. cannot fathom this kind of evil. I just can't. Uh, you know, human trafficking, uh, we talked about the labor trafficking, trafficking and the sex trafficking, but, but organ trafficking within the umbrella of human trafficking is very real. Um, uh, that that wow. couple, first couple I met with, they were in uh, the Marriott down in uh, Nicaragua, and a Russian was buying under the guise of taking these children, and uh, the, the promise was we're going to take your child and send your child to America and get it adopted into a great life. And so they were buying 9-year-olds and 10-year-olds for $500 a piece. Right there in the hotel lobby of the Marriott, he was wearing a, a professional suit under the guise of being an adoption agency. And um, this gentleman, his only sole purpose was as he would buy the children, they would take them away, kill them, put them, their organs into coolers and fly them over to Russia and uh, sell them on the black market for $250,000 for a cooler of organs, right? Wow. 
Who even? I, 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 who came up with that business plan? Yeah. And not only who. I, 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 so once you come up with a plan, okay, well, you can find some criminal people that you know. I guess they can separate that stuff out. I don't know how. But who who was sitting around coming up? It, that had to be Satan himself. Exactly. Planned Parenthood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, poor Planned <laughs> There's another poor one. Who came up with that one? Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I hope this ain't being recorded. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But, but that's the kind of, it, it, it's just evil in a proportion, you know, I, I don't get it. I, I, you know, I, listen, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, so I, I, I grew up a southern man. My dad still opens doors for his, his, my mother, and I still open doors for my wife, and I expect suitors to open doors for my daughter. You know, to think that, that a man could take a female and, and allow her to be raped 10 to 15 times a day so that he can continue to make $1,000 a day off of her, I, I, don't, I don't get that, not on any level. It, it, it just, I don't, um, nope. you know, I just go into neutral on that. I, I, in fact, I can't understand it so much it doesn't even make me mad because I just can't go there. Um, yep. So, but, but that's what we're up against. Amen. First time I come in contact with, uh, uh, well, you know, back then, I, a lot lasered. Uh this was 23, almost 20, almost 23 years ago. Uh, I was at a truck stop. I was just sitting there, and I seen this girl come walking up, rolled my window down. She asked me for 180 company. I said, how old are you? You know, she just kind of, and I knew she was lying because she kind of stuttered. She says, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 20. I said, no, you're not. I said, I said, you need to get home. Well, she took off. Another girl come walking in front of me and I just I kind of waved her over I said you know rolled my window down I said I said you have a minute she got in my truck and I said I just want to ask you something I said I'll give you five dollars if you if you'll answer me truthfully I said I'm not going to give you any money until you answer me truthfully how old is that girl that just left she said she's 16 there you go she said she's a runaway and we have been trying to get her to go back home. I said, well, with you guys out here, she ain't going to go home. Mm-hmm. I said, here's your $5, and I'll get out of my truck. And, and there's the truth, right? So what did she run away from, one, um, yeah, that was exactly. so terrible that, that that lifestyle is better? Right. Oh, do I have empathy for her, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, but here's, here's something that, that should scare everybody. Um, 100% of runaways, 100% of runaways are um, introduced to trafficking or traffickers within the first 48 hours, 100%. Where does that stat come from? Every girl that's rescued says within the first you know, two days she was approached and, hey, you look like you need shelter, food, care, something, a shower, Right, and I've got a way that you you can have that. Come with me. And of those hundred percent of the girls, thirty percent of runaways are end up being trafficked. Thirty percent. Now those are just percentages, and I hate to use stats. So, but let me make it a little more real. Here in Charlotte, we have ten thousand runaways each and every year. Ten thousand, which means that third uh, three thousand girls.
Welcome. This service is provided by freeconferencecall.com. Please enter job cost code followed by the pound or hash sign. There are five participants in the conference. The recording has started. There, what I did. She, uh, I guess really the whole neighborhood averages half a million dollar homes. Muted. Talking about, you know, a nasty place. This is suburbia at its best. Um, but she started explaining to me that her 10-year-old son was playing his game. I'm going to call it a Game Boy, man. A PS, PS4, whatever, whatever game deal. And so now, you know, you can talk back and forth between, you know, different gamers at the same time. Her 10-year-old son uh, left the chat questions um, on the screen. So the mom walks in and, and reads them, and sure enough, a predator had been asking her son questions, you know, adult questions. And um, and so she had sent me a screenshot of it later on, but it was absolutely there was a man in that chat room that was going after the 10-year-old boys. And so this mother, you know, sent out the word to all the parents in the neighborhood, and sure enough, there were other boys of that same age that were playing that same game that were being hit on and, and predatorized in the exact same way. So... You know, and gosh, and that's that's the boy sitting in front of his TV with his game box, to let alone the cell phones that are you know, smartphones that are running around now. It, and yeah. and what people don't realize is, not only are you less likely to be kidnapped off the street, you are likely to be what they call groomed, which is me forming a relationship with you and using those fake profiles, not for a day or a week, but for months and months, like three months, six months. They will groom these relationships till they have finally isolated that child from their parents, their friends, and maybe single mom is working a double shift Friday and Saturday, and so that child will meet them on Sunday or Saturday or Friday. And the point is, by the time mom gets around to wondering where the child is, the child's been gone a couple of days. So uh, it, it's sophisticated. Why is it sophisticated? Because each one of those children is worth three hundred and fifty grand a year cash. Now, if I if, if I just take if I'm so cold that I'm I can turn that child into a product, I will work very hard for three months for for that kind of asset, money making asset, right? And that's what I think we're failing to realize is not only is the evil there, but the monetary greed motivation to do the work and do the work really well. While we're all going to work and our kids are going to school and maybe a couple minutes a day, we're all checking into this sex trafficking thing. There's somebody there working a 12-hour day. And why is he working a 12-hour day? Because he's making a million dollars a year. All right? That's the reality of the situation. Cisco, that had to be back in the early 90s. That's when Al Gore invented the Internet. But anyway, uh, <laughs> right. I was, <laughs> right. was going to point out um, one thing that uh, uh, my pastor told us when he was getting involved in this um, um, one of the number one um, trafficking events in the United States just happened here uh, last week in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. He said there Super is Bowl. more sex trafficking yeah, going on. And, and you had mentioned Houston and the Super Bowl, and, and, and that's when that, that come back to me. Um, I have not heard any um, specifics. I live up in north-central Minnesota about the amount of arrests, but... Uh, I, I go into the Twin Cities every every night, and uh, I hear I, I mean the, the the influx of traffic and people. There was 91 private jets uh, at our airport um, the weekend of the Super Bowl, and and can you just imagine the uh, the amount of money that was on them jets and and uh, some of the entertainment um, that they were looking to endure? Sure. And, and so why is the Super Bowl, why would, that, why would trafficking be related to the Super Bowl? Again, it's always going to go back to demand. You have put more men in one place at one time. Statistically, yep. if one out of five is buying, that means if you've got 80,000 or 100,000 guys there, you've got a lot of customers. So I know when we were in Houston, um, the, Houston the, the, the captain of the Houston Police Department um, has a, uh, she has a huge heart for trafficking. So in Houston particularly, uh, you got a top-down local law enforcement desire to see trafficking uh, ended. So um, 
that particular uh, captain, I mean, they they did stings for the four weeks leading up to the Super Bowl. It was a, a, a really intentional deal to go after the men who were buying, not not, not necessarily the traffickers, you know, but she, she gets the demand understanding. Um, and so uh, we had a, exceptional results. Um, between the county law enforcement and the city law enforcement, there were over 650 men that were arrested, um, which is which is awesome. You know, I mean, that, we didn't make a dent in it, but we let them know we were going to be there. Now, Minneapolis, the uh, the captain in charge of vice in Minneapolis had also flown down to Houston, and uh, he trained with us, uh, and he had brought a nonprofit um, person with him. Um, and so they actually trained with us for a couple of days and then took that knowledge back to Minneapolis. But I, like you, do, you know, I haven't researched the results yet or made any phone calls to find out what really happened. But it's all because the men showed up there. And if you think about Charlotte, well, why Charlotte number eight? We have an international airport, so men fly in to have sex, sexual tourism. Well, wait a minute, men are flying to – you've got plenty of American men flying to Thailand, right? You brought that up earlier. Well – there's a lot of guys that fly into the United States. Well, why are the guys flying to Thailand? Because they want to be with an Asian girl. Well, Asian guys already got Asian girls, so they're flying to America to be with American girls, right? So we're not special here in America. We're not exporting females. We've got guys coming in to be with our girls. So anytime you have an international airport, know that men are coming into town for that. And Charlotte has a great uh, convention business. So, again, we're bringing men to town. We have professional sports. We're bringing men to town. We have truck driving. You know, Charlotte's one truck driving capitals in our country. We're bringing men to town. So we have the, the, the big four here. So we have the airport. We have trucking and transportation. Houston uh, has shipping, right? So transportation can be many forms. But transportation, international airport, professional sports, and, and convention and tourism. If you would take those four, you can look at the top ten cities in the country and know what those four would be. On the East Coast, you're talking about Atlanta. You're going to be talking about Charlotte. You're going to be talking about D.C. You're going to be talking about New York, if that makes sense. So uh, it's always going to yeah, demand. All you, all you need is an oil boom there, and uh, you'll have all five bases covered. Like, so there you go. Not, <laughs> Dakota, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. Uh, so, yeah, you've got fracking colonies breaking up now or, or starting up now that, that, that have uh, – you know, the, the girls are being trafficked in there. In North Carolina, the reason the state ranks so high is we also have a huge uh, chicken and, and pig farm population as well as, as still tobacco. So we're bringing in migrant workers. And so while the migrant worker might be being labor trafficked during the week, there's vans bringing the girls into the farms on Fridays, and the guys are allowed to have sex with them. And so those girls are being trafficked to keep the guys in line as a perk for being tra human trafficked, right? This, the whole six cycle is unbelievable. It makes perfect business sense. But uh, when you're battling, you know, good and evil, it's, it's just unbelievable. But it, it always go back to if there's, there's enough men in a room, somebody's going to bring a woman in. And uh, it's just that simple. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right, brother. Thousand dollars. I commend you. I commend you for what you're doing. I really do. Well, I, I'm sure there's plenty of people on this call that God says and is going to call good and faithful servant, and that's all I'm after. Uh, he just happened go. to place me here, and, and I go where he says to go. That's simple obedience. Amen. All right, what's your name again? My name is Bo. B-O. Oh. Last name is Quickle, Q-U-I-C-K-E-L. And you can reach me through the website, Vigilante Truth, V I G I L A N T E, Vigilante Truth dot com. All right, what's your weekend plans? <laughs> Do you need me to be somewhere? <laughs> Just to give you an update, Bo, the, the, the commercial you heard about Smokehouse Studios, yes, you sir. are talking to Mr. Smokehouse right Mr. now. Mr. Smokehouse, there we go. <laughs> and it's not a barbecue. It's not a barbecue pit. <laughs> I was really hoping it was. When you mentioned it to me in the very beginning uh, a few weeks ago, I was thinking barbecue. So, you know, it was a letdown. I mean, not a letdown, sir, with all due respect, but when I heard the commercial earlier tonight, I went, oh, it's not barbecue. 
you know. You're going to get an invite. You're, you're about 30 seconds away from an invite. I can feel it in my spirit. <laughs> right. And right. I collected royalties, Greg Martin. I collected royalties. <laughs> okay, first of all, you are an, an elegant speaker in the layman terms field because you are easily understood and you break it down so simplistic that mm -hmm. although I was totally aware of trafficking and what was involved, not that I, I'm, a, I'm affiliated with any type of organization, but I'm aware of what's going on and I understand why and how it works. But, buddy, you broke her down. I mean, you brought it home the way you described it. And I have a volley of listeners worldwide. Uh, what what are you doing tomorrow night? <laughs> well, I don't know that my wife's told me yet. That's always the proper answer, isn't it? Um, there you go. If, if I can't do it tomorrow, tomorrow night, I believe you do it every Saturday night. Is that correct? Every Saturday night, yeah. Well, if, if it's not tomorrow night, sir, it can be one of these other Saturday nights. That I can promise you. Okay. Um, well. But okay. if, if you want to get my number, uh, give me a call directly. That will be great. Okay. And, and then, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to work that out. I think Paul will tell you I'm pretty easy on that kind of stuff. He, he gave me one or two dates, and I said, absolutely, yes. So here we are tonight. And, um you know, for me, this is 24-7, so a Saturday doesn't mean anything other than I just need to make sure that I don't, I, I can give you the fullest attention that the Holy Spirit wants to play with me. Okay, because tomorrow night, well, what I've been talking about the last couple of weeks, and I didn't even realize I was talking about it. It just, it, it all hit me this week. Uh, I've been talking about justice, mm. uh, especially with what we're seeing going on in the government, and the cry out for justice that the church in America is not crying out for, but the remnant are. Right. And and I have I have been doing teachings on what God says about justice and how He expects us to demand justice because if He comes in to get the justice, it's not going to be anywhere near the way we think it's going to be. It's going to be a big one when He comes in. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, and uh, and so what we need to understand is we need to call for the justice in the, the corrupt that we're seeing right now because if God steps in to intervene, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come down on all of us because when it rains, it rains on the just and the unjust. And that's kind of the angle that I have been, been going. And, uh, man, the way you broke this down and the way it's so easily understood, it's opened my eyes now what to look for and um, what to because you know I've I, ra I raised a little niece because her dad died of cancer in my first marriage and uh, all through her growing up I mean I've told her what to watch for and when she was like eight or ten years old I would put her I would show her where all the wiring was in the back taillights of a car. And then mm -hmm. I, would te I would teach her that if she was to ever get thrown in a trunk or anything, to start yanking those wires out because the car running down the road with no brake lights and taillights run the risk of getting pulled over. And and I would, I would shut the trunk lid and lock her in it and have her feel around to find those wires. Of course, I was just telling her, you know, when I was a kid, we used to play in trunks and get locked in the trunk and, you know, uh, give them knowledge on some sort of defense. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, with, with what I'm talking about, I guess you could call it a series. I don't, I don't plan series. I don't plan things. I just, I guess I just speak what the Holy Spirit lays on me. But, but what you talked about tonight is just falling right along with, uh, especially what I'll be talking about tomorrow night, because so yeah, let's 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 exchange numbers, and I'm not trying to to rob guests off of Brother Steve. Or <laughs> I, <laughs> think, <laughs> I think he told me before he was hoping that would happen, so I don't think you're doing anything wrong there. 
Yeah, but uh, he has to get one on all the time. You can, you can <laughs> yeah. play the three-fold uh, chord uh, card, Greg, if you want. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, uh, all right, let's, let's exchange numbers. And, and I, I know how it is because, I mean, I know, I know your wife is a very giving woman to allow you time away from the family to do what you do. So I don't want to take time away from that either. Uh, but, but yeah, I think, I think you and I would have a, a great time because it would be a back and forth, you know, uh, kind of a conversation round table kind of thing. Um, it look, just looking at my schedule for next week, uh, I know next Saturday evening I could do something or next Saturday, um, which is what the seventeenth. So that's open. If we can't work it out for tomorrow, sir, I, I will make my seventeenth, you know, available for you. That I can do. Uh, but yeah, let's change some numbers, and if I can work it out any sooner, then I'd be more than happy to. Because, you know, this is what my heart is, and and if I don't let it out, I will explode. I'm pretty sure. Well, yeah, and I have a lot of truck drivers. I mean, a lot of truck drivers that listen to what I do, simply because you know I'm in the field, and that's how I got it off the ground. And they need to know this stuff because right. when you when you start talking about t- tattoos and the way that they 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 act when you when you talk, I have I have bumped into women like that. Sure, you have. And and didn't even realize it until you brought it to my attention tonight. And, and this is the things that we need to know. This is the things that just society needs to know. Right. You know. Right. Amen, brother. So. Okay. Yeah, I say let's strike while the iron's hot, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. So, and are you Vigilante you. Truth also? Yeah, VigilanteTruth.com or Vigilante Truth, the uh, incorporated, the MPO, is the umbrella uh, nonprofit. So, yes, I'm the founder of Vigilante Truth. And so, under Vigilante okay. Truth, we have, and Vigilante Truth would be the truth of everything you heard me say tonight how that would apply specifically to trucking and enter into, into that marketplace, we would have our vigilante truckers. If you go on my website, you'll see I, uh, I don't have it tonight, but uh, at that time, you know, long goatee, and, uh, and I'm riding my Harley. So, you know, we have vigilante bikers. You go down, uh, I, I've never was, back in the day when I, when I was pretending to be somebody special and would go on these uh, golf trips for the weekends, uh, I never went on a golf trip that girls weren't being bought and, po- and paid for. So, um, you know, we have vigilante golfers, and so I'm, I, I, we do a golf tournament annually, but we also, um, you know, I speak into the hearts of golfers and, and, and those kind of places, anywhere men are, right? And then you have people that are just in their RVs that you guys see on the road all the time that, that you wish maybe they could drive just a little bit better, but they want to get involved in this because they're on the road and, and they're, you know, fueling up and, and, and out in the communities. And so we have vigilante travelers. But, yeah, all of that is under Vigilante Truth. Okay, yeah, no, I'm on your website now. I just, uh, I was just curious if that was... Uh, if, you're at the right Vigilante. place. I know you're, you're at Vigilante Trucking. I didn't know if uh, you were also the Vigilante Truth. Yes. Vigilante Truth is, okay. the, is the go-to. I'm sure if I click somewhere, I'll be able to find out how I can get some uh, stickers for the back of my trailers. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, well, you've got my number, so you can certainly get uh, get some of those. You know, and that's the the reality of it. I, I tell people all the time: New York City. Uh, Giuliani didn't clean up New York City. The Guardian Angels cleaned up New York City, and they would just stand on corners with their little yellow beanies, looking silly. But the reality is, the the criminals knew that they were on the corner as witnesses. And, yes, they were there to tell a girl, hey, don't go down that alley, go down this alley, or maybe they walked her to her front stoop and got her home safely. But the reality was they were just standing there, and they were witnesses to crime. And so what better person not to have crime in front of than the witness? So there was just no crime on those streets. And this is the exact same thing. So while I don't want the vigilante truth uh, wings and sword to become the McDonald's arches of the trucking industry, um, because, because, you know, then, uh, then the pimps, if the pimps don't understand that, that somebody's going to make a phone call, it, right, and, and certainly the guardian angels with their little yellow beanies, they were going to make a phone call. So I don't want every single truck in America to, to have uh, the wings and sword on it. Now, Tat's doing a great job of that, building awareness, and I know a lot of the guys put the stickers on them, but I can tell you that the pimps don't care about those stickers. It's great for the awareness. Um, 
but it, it, it doesn't really affect the, the female. The, the girl doesn't even, uh, 100% of the girls that we've rescued, 493, and I say we, this is we, the organizations here in, in North Carolina, 400 plus girls that we've rescued in the last six years, 100% of those girls have said that she's not being trafficked. Yep. They don't even know they're being trafficked. They're so mind whipped, they don't even know they're being trafficked. So if you have a girl in a truck stop, she doesn't see the wings and swords. She doesn't know she's being trafficked. No, she's not calling my rescue hotline. You, know, you get the random stray one freaked out. Like I so said, that, that, that story I shared earlier, that was a lady who had never been a part of this life at all and just like it thrown into it. And so she was not yet manipulated and controlled enough to realize I, I need to ask for help. The girls at the truck stops, you can give them a cell phone and keys to a car, and they will go to the truck stop, service the men, make the 1000 and bring it back, right, and tell you they're not being trafficked. <laughs> no sense trying to rescue that girl. She's going to kick and scream her way all the way back to the pimp. So, <laughs> I mean, that's the yep. truth of it. So the, 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 the tat sticker that I see on a lot of trucks, what that's really doing is it's informing other drivers. You know, it's a, it's a conversation amongst drivers on what to look for. Um, so for me, I'd love for, uh, I think we were talking, and in fact, I know we were talking about it earlier before even the phone call started or, or, the, or the show started um, about my 20 trucks becoming 100 and becoming 1,000. Uh, I was talking with Covenant Trucking out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. I call them the, the, the Chick-fil-A of the trucking industry. Um, and, and that was their thing. Well, Bo, let us you know, put, put a sticker on every truck. And I said, no, I don't want it on every truck. But if you could tell me out of your 2,500 trucks, give me five guys and you wrap five trucks that, that, that would really be a part of this, that's what I want out there. So, you know, I'm happy to send you stickers, but the idea is, is not to, to make it where the pimps just think it's a random person and they're not going to do anything if you're following me. Yep, I sure am. I'm picking up everything you're putting down. There you go. Yeah. Well, you need to call Fry Miller. Talk to uh, Dave Fry Miller. He'll uh, he he might work with you a little bit better than Covenant. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm happy to make the call, sir. Of that I can assure you. Yeah, he. Uh, I've got a buddy of mine that works drives over there, and he's all about the military, and he wraps his trailers uh, with uh, military challenge coins and stuff. Right. And uh, he's a good Christian man, and he basically, my friend Ralph, that uh, is doing the role uh, ride for Reeves, he's uh, created this little nonprofit deal to uh, put Reeves on veterans' graves. But mm. um, Dave has, I mean, the money he's given Ralph just to do what Ralph needs to do is amazing. So he would, he would be a good man to contact if you want to wrap some trucks. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, the beautiful thing about the trucking company um, is that we take 100% of the profits of the trucking company, and I use that to fight trafficking so that I can spend my time fighting trafficking instead of, instead of you know, selling hot dogs at the church on Saturdays and this fundraiser and that fundraiser and using all my volunteer talents and hours for the next fundraiser. So, um, But having said that, uh, we're always willing to accept more. You know? <laughs> so it's... Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, any kind of contacts like that that you think somebody would open their heart to what we're doing, we're I'm certainly uh, willing to accept any help in any way. Amen. I'm going to pass your information on to my pastor. He's kind of got a two-year program right now over in Thailand. But, um, maybe uh, when he's done with that little tour, maybe God will bring him back this way and you and him can get hooked up and he can... Uh, he can help be your your hotel Johnny or something, you know, yeah, your undercover. That would be awesome. Absolutely. He's, he's got he's got all kinds of technology from Exodus Road, and he's telling me about some of it and what they do and how they do it. It's pretty cool. So yeah, it, it is kind of kind of fun. Uh, when I do work yeah. with law enforcement, they're always a little jealous of me um, <laughs> because we don't have the rules that they have, and some of them are just blatantly stupid. When we're doing hotel outreach, I call it hotel outreach. Um, or hotel intervention, but when we're doing that, I run with a team of 10, and when I'm with law enforcement, uh, they'll run with a team of 22. <laughs> you know, they just have so many rules, it takes that many people yep. to, to pull off, you know, and of our 10, three of those will be 
literally just in a, in a secondary motel room that are praying, right? So that, while I believe that's 100% functional, um, that was not part of the 22 officers, right? So, um, yeah. But we we get to play with the electronics. So you can mo- the, thank God for the for Al Gore and the internet. In that, I could buy all the electronics that that any good spy organization <laughs> has. Um, yep. And, and the quality thereof has become uh, feasible to purchase. So, yeah, we we do have a lot of fun with it on that side. Yep. Amen. Yeah. It, uh, he uh, he was also a guardian angel on the the um, uh, sub artist. Uh, uh, train in Illinois, the uh, commuter train. Nice. In downtown Chicago, so he's he's always been an adventurous one. So. <laughs> yeah, I like him already. <laughs> like him already. Yeah. Well, he's a Packers fan. And he likes the Cubs. I don't know if that strikes. Ah, uh, that that changes things. But still, <laughs> you know, he's got a heart for God, and, and we'll just stop there. Amen. Yep. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, brother, we've definitely enjoyed this evening. This has been enlightening, and I'm um, I'm liking how the guys are grabbing a hold of this because this is something that we all have to be aware of. And uh, if there is any way, and as I expressed today, if there is any way the Christian Truckers Network uh, can be of assistance to you, anything that we can do, we would be more than happy to, uh, you know, come alongside you. Well, thank you. Uh, that, that that is a, uh, you know, the, it started out with with an I, and it's becoming an us. And uh, the more people we can partner with on this, uh, the, the stronger we'll be. Uh, especially those yeah. those members who are faith based, because, uh, you know, we all know the scripture that we are fighting a spiritual battle, not one here in the world, uh, against flesh and blood of man. And so, um, boy, you you want to if you're not really reading the Bible and believing the Bible and understanding the supernatural that's, that's going on, uh, jump on in the arena here with, uh, with us fighting trafficking, and you'll get an eyeful that you only see in movies. <laughs> uh, the more prayer, you know, people say, what can I do? Pray. Now, a lot of times that's a too quick or too easy an answer, and nobody really prays. But I tell you, we are fighting on Satan's favorite playground. And he does not like us there, and he does not like us winning. And we need real, honest to God, on your knees, uh, just going after, you know, protection, uh, a full hedge with, with no holes, um, conviction of hearts, uh, protection of hearts. Uh, you know, every time we do anything, any of these undercover operations and things of that nature, I have to spend, you know, days just getting that filth off of me, the spiritual filth off of me um so prayer is huge 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 i can't stress it enough so uh if, if as you guys are I got your windshield time if you would say a, a a prayer on behalf of vigilante truth so much as god would bring it to your heart and each and every time he does um uh, gosh I, I can't ask for any more than that well that we definitely will do there's no doubt about that awesome all right well listen well, i'll get i'll get I'll get your number from Steve, and yes, then uh, is that, is that going to be your cell number? Yes, sir, it will be, and you'll be okay. able to text me, call me, leave a voicemail, and we can get emails back and forth, whatever we need to do. We'll work it out. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll just go ahead, and, and I'm on my way home. I won't get home till like, in the morning, but when I get home, it should be around 10 or 11. Uh, I'll shoot you a text, and okay. uh, if, if you can come home tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, your time, let let me know, and then I'll shoot you the the call in number and all that. Okay. But uh, if you, if you can't, just let me know you can't, and then we'll set it up for some other time. But yeah, if, you well, could do if it, I can't tomorrow, I will tell you I can next week. Okay. That, that I, I I will I will promise you that. So let's see. Uh, let's yes. Let's do some texting in the morning. I, I will have some answers by then, and. Okay. Uh, then you'll know whether the Holy Spirit's going to fill you with something for tomorrow night. <laughs> and then and I'll be happy to follow that up. I, I know that uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't miss out on any plan. Right. Now, I'll, I'll just tell you now, my program, I'll talk about, like, prophecy, uh, what the prophets have told us, what we're seeing happening right now. I just take it week by week. So that's kind of my, my, my format. Awesome. And so I... I have I have a whole show planned regardless, so 
don't don't worry about it. if you you know if you can't if you can't make it or something I I can fill the gaps because I've got plenty of material. Very and, good. Uh, but yeah, yeah, just quick as we can get this done, I'd love it. This be- <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in agreement with that. Yeah. So oh, man, maybe. all right. Okay, well, brother, before we leave, Bob, I'd certainly like to have a word of prayer with you. Please. And, uh, Father God, as we come before you this evening, Lord, it's been a very enlightening evening. And, Lord God, we know that you didn't bring our brother into the midst with us for no reason. Father God, you have a reason for each and everything you do. And, Lord God, is enlightening us as to what's going on out here in the truck stops. And out here, just it doesn't even have to be in the truck stop, Lord, just what's happening out here in the marketplace, period. And, Father God, I just pray, Lord God, that you would continue to open doors up to our brother. And, Father God, continue to bless him, Lord. And, Father God, as he goes out and he shares what you have given him, he shares this knowledge that he has, Lord, that, Father, people will get on board. People will get fired up about this because, Lord, these are all your children. And, Father God, it's a horrific thing that is happening to him. And so, Father God, I pray your hedge of protection around him, around his drivers, Lord, as they're out into these truck stops fighting this fight. So, Father God, as we come before you, Lord, we know that your angels encampeth around about him, Lord God, and we know that no hurt or harm or evil wicked thing will come upon him. And, Father God, we're just going to give you all the praise, all the glory, and we're going to give you all the honor, and it's in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen, amen. 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 I will be in touch with you. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll split that $100, and I'm going to charge Greg to give him your phone number. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to that. Hey, if we can, at least it's only 100 if we, if we can't get barbecue, <laughs> right. it, really if I'm not getting barbecue and husk puppies out of this, you're right. Uh, we're going to have to get yeah. some monetary, I guess. <laughs> we'll we'll <laughs> let pay for it. Let me, yeah. let me share one little thing just real quick. I don't mean to keep you all, but i got to tell uh, Bo about this he'll get a big old kick out of it uh, my wife and I, I my my testimony is 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 amazing but but I, I i lost my first life and moved back home to nashville and uh ended up marrying my childhood sweetheart after i moved back and so we started a life together and we just recently, we're two and a half years married now. But our honeymoon was October, the, we got married on October the 3rd, and we had already prepaid for a cruise to leave Puerto Rico and go to the Caribbean. Everything was paid for. I mean, everything, airline ticket, everything. And we got married on the 3rd. We got up on the 4th of October two years ago, two and a half years ago. And flew to Charlotte, North Carolina, because we had to change planes to Charlotte and then fly out of Charlotte to Puerto Rico. Now, we had to be in Puerto Rico by that evening to get on the boat. And that's when Hurricane Joaquin was coming up. (laughs) And uh, right about the time that we were supposed to take off from Charlotte, we'd already boarded the plane. That's about the time that freighter got lost outside of the Bahamas in, in Joaquin. And all planes were being diverted to fly south down to Miami and then cut out across the ocean to go to Puerto Rico. Three planes in a row had mechanical problems and could not take off from Charlotte. They took us off of that plane, put us on another one, and it didn't have brakes. They took us off that one, put us on another one. That one lost its steering as we were back in three planes. And finally, American Airlines said, well, we don't have any other planes. So they said, you're going to have to lay over, and we'll fly you to Charlotte the next morning, which would do us no good because the, we called the, the cruise line, and they weren't going to wait for us. So everybody on that plane headed to Puerto Rico was going on the cruise. There's 150 people that weren't going to be able to, they were going to miss out on the cruise. And so Americans said they'll put us up for the night in a motel and then fly us out the next morning. Well, it's going to do none of us any good. So they said, well, you can either get your voucher down. Anyway, we had to stand in line. My wife and I were the last in line. So we had 150 people in a row saying, you ain't doing nothing for me. 
<laughs> you ain't doing nothing for me. And they called the news crew out, okay? And the news crew came out there. And uh, uh, I'd already, I would already made my mind up. So we were last in line. And American was telling them the same thing. We will put you up for the night and fly you out there tomorrow. And that wasn't good enough for them, you know. So when we finally started to get up to the, to the counter, this little, I, she's in her 20s, she's like liberal, and she come running over and she's like, oh, come join our group because if, if all of our voices are heard together, then they'll do something. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you just go on over there and hold hands, thank you, and buy y'all, because I said, I'm fixing to show you how, you know, the real world operates here. So I got up to the counter. And the guy started telling me the same deal. And I said, look, fella, I said, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to lay out for you what you're going to do for me. And I said, if we're in agreement, I said, I'm going to be cool with it. And he said, what? And I said, put us on a first-class flight back to Nashville, Tennessee. And I said, buddy, I'll dance at your wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he looked at me, and he's like, Really? Is that all you want? I said, yeah. And his little fingers got the tapping. And uh, and he he said, all right, plane leaves in an hour and a half. And he handed us two tickets first class. And uh, so off to Nashville, we, we flew back to Nashville. Missed out on the cruise and everything. But we had it insured. But the whole point of telling you that story is I sat at that Charlotte airport for 12 hours dealing with that whole ordeal. And uh, two things, the Lord did not want a plane leaving that ground with me on it. That's mm. first and foremost, probably because of the hurricane. But secondly, I spent 12 hours in the Charlotte, North Carolina airport, and I cared nothing about I deliver about once a week to a little place right there at the end of the runway at Charlotte. Right. A little steel place. Yeah, and I just cringe every time I get around that airport. Yeah, I just... <laughs> you, can, you can feel, uh, it, it, especially if you're prophetic, uh, and I see that a lot in people who are prophetic, you can feel the atmosphere uh, of an area. Uh, yeah. So you can feel the atmosphere in, the, in, that, um, in that airport. Um, you know, when, when God, he, for some reason, God calls me to Houston, Texas a fair amount. And um, when, when I land in Texas, in Houston, from the entire time I'm there, it's like I'm just walking through mud. Uh, you just, oh, yeah. I just feel it on me. And uh, and there's truck stops. Um, uh, yeah, we might be doing undercover. I might be just be personally traveling, but I'll stop at a truck stop to, to get my own gas, even if it's in, in a car. But um, and I'll walk the outer perimeter of the of the truck stop and just pray over it, for the simple fact that there are some truck stops that are just so thick in darkness. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so those are the, you know, I would, I just would tell you every time you feel that way in your spirit, um, you know, just, just pray it out. Uh, we, I've yeah. done some undercover works. Uh, sometimes when I, I get a truck in, I won't wrap it for a few weeks and we'll take it down to truck stops and use it for undercover stuff. Um, I've been in truck stops that I can't spend, you know, a full three day weekend in to do undercover work. I, I just got to get out. I can just feel it, it. It's so intense that I'll just, I, I'll back out. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah, no, I, I know what you're talking about. I sure do. You, you sound a little Pentecostal, are you? Oh, I'm 100% Pentecostal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>